Our way back into Hebrews chapter 13, okay? Hebrews 13. We're going to read where we were this morning in Hebrews 13. Pick up about verse 8. Stop about verse 14. Okay? Hebrews 13. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings... For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, through which those who were so occupied were not benefited. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat, for the body of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. So let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. And in verse 15, I'll read that. Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise of God that is the fruit of the lips to give thanks to his name. Man, you may be seated. Well, if you remember from this morning, we are at the end of Hebrews in our study, this great study of the book of Hebrews. And the writer has given us this quick review. The writer has given us his concluding words to the book of Hebrews. He's given us his concluding words of what he wants us to know. And a lot of this is what he's speaking of. He's kind of reviewing again as you read on down from what we've seen this morning about Jesus Christ, he makes hint to the fact that Jesus Christ is is the one and only sacrifice. We mentioned that, okay? He's the one-time sacrifice. You pick that up. I didn't say it this morning, but one of the verses outside of the book of Hebrews, one of the verses that talks about Jesus being the one-time sacrifice is Romans chapter 6. Verse 10, you can look at that in your own, in your own time. And he talks about the, the Old Testament system and the offering of sacrifices for the sins of man. And he alludes to how it would go on and on and on again in this world in which we live. And how Jesus is the ultimate one, the ultimate sacrifice, one time sacrifice never to be offered up again and he brought us down to verse 14 and that's where we'll look at this evening this is where we looked at this morning for this world is not our permanent home remember we focused on that we focused on the fact that this world in which we live is not our permanent home we have we have a we have a greater home a perfect home yet to come that's our hope and in this home, if you will, we've, we've seen this morning, in this home is where Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, resides. And that's the joy for us as believers. We one day, one day we leave this world as temporary residents and we go to our eternal home in glory. The eternal home that the Lord Jesus has made for us So we can enjoy His presence forever and ever. We get to enjoy that. We get to understand that even more as we're with Him in that eternal home. And we looked this morning in in Philippians, a few passages in Philippians, and Peter also talked about it, okay, about being temporary residents as, as Peter was giving encouragement to the believers in his day and time, that were struggling so much, and he's giving them encouragement and reminding them, to so listen, you are only temporary, you are pretty much foreigners here in this land, and the promised one, the promised land is to come, the promised home is to come, and Peter gave encouraging words, and, and so did Paul to the, to the Philippians. He offered up encouraging words to them. 
giving them encouraging words, reminding them that, that listen, one day when it's all over and done with, you too will be in the presence of the very one who saved you. Paul talked about his dilemma, did he not? In, in, in Philippians chapter, chapter 1, verse, verse 20 to about 25, Paul talked about his dilemma that he struggled with. And we looked a little bit about that at that this morning. And Paul's dilemma was, was what? He, he knew it was, it, was, it was great, good for him to be here, left behind with the early believers. It would be a great benefit to them. But in his heart, he longed to be where? In his heart, he longed to be with his Lord and his God. And, and that's so too how, how we should be in our lives is we should long to be with him and long to be in his presence. And yet we are left here for a time. And while we are here, may we serve him. May we serve him with everything we have for his glory, for his honor, Paul also talks similar words in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We looked at that this morning. His understand of the earthly walk in this world in which we live against the backdrop of being in the eternal home with the glorious one. Now I want you to turn to John chapter 17 this evening. And that's where we're going to go and kind of camp out in John 17. It's, it's a passage of scripture. If it, if it sounds familiar, it probably is because there was a time in, in the past where we looked at the study of John 17. and This is the prayer of the Lord Jesus. and As Jesus says, offers up a prayer. As He offers up a prayer in John 17... To the Father, okay, and the prayer is one to five is for himself, about himself, if you will, and six to nineteen was for his disciples, and twenty to twenty-six was for all the future believers. But it's interesting in this in this prayer, as I was looking this week, as as we as we come to Hebrews chapter thirteen, verse fourteen, and as we're looking at our eternal home going to our eternal home against this world in which we live. Okay? Listen to what Jesus says as He talks about the world in which we live. Listen to what He has to say. We'll pick up about verse... Let's just... We'll start verse 1 and, and move on down through there. Jesus spoke these things and lifted up His eyes to heaven. He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify Your Son that the Son may glorify You, even as You have him, given Him authority over all flesh, so to all whom You have given Him, He may give eternal life. This is eternal life that they may know You, the only true God, and Jesus Christ to whom You have sent. I glorified You here on earth. Okay, I glorified you here. You sent me here to earth and I glorified you. You sent me here to this falling world and I glorified you. I glorified you in this falling world. I brought you glory by completing the work, if you will, that you gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. For I reveal to you the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours. You gave them to me. They have kept your word. Now, they know that everything I have is a gift from you. For I passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it and know that I came from you and they believe you sent me. Now listen to what he says in 9. My prayer is not for what? This world. My prayer is not for the world. He understands, of course, the fallenness of the world. His prayer wasn't for the world. But for those the Father has given him. 
because they belong to you. His prayer is for the disciples. His prayer is for these disciples that are living in this fallen world that they would remain faithful, that they would remain true to the Word as they lived in this fallen world. And as they remain true to the Word as they lived in this fallen world, that they would long to what? To one day be taken from this world into the presence of the glorious One. For all who are mine belong to you. You have given them to me so they bring me glory. When we, when we go into the presence of the Most High God eternally, if you will, it will be a time of eternal glory. It will be a time of eternal glory. As he says in verse 11, Now I am departing from the world. Okay, I know he's talking about himself. I get that. But listen, we too, one day when we breathe our last breath, we will depart from this world and that's, and that's what happens to us after we die. And as a believer, we're immediately in the presence of the Most High God. Lord God, Jesus says, I'm departing from this world, but they are staying in this world. And I'm coming to you. He knew he understood that he was leaving. His time for the cross was around the corner. We've looked at this passage of Scripture before, but in a different context. But I want you to see this evening... Uh, how many times he references the world in the state that it's in. Okay? He goes down through here and he references the, the world in the state that it's in. And it's not a great state. It's not a great place to be. But he says, they are staying in the world. But I am coming to you in verse 11. Yet they themselves are finding themselves in the world and I come to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name. This is Paul longed in Philippians chapter 1. This is Paul longed in Philippians chapter 1 to be freed from this world in which he lived. But yet he knew that his calling was to remain here for the time and he knew when his time to go home was near because he speaks of that in 2 Timothy at the end of 2 Timothy in his letter to, to Timothy sometime, sometime later. But he knew that as he lived in this world he needed to serve his Lord. He needed to be faithful to his God. Faithful to the one who saved him. Serve him with everything he had. Do his will. But while doing that, it seems that Paul always kept an eye on what? On the other side. He always kept an eye on the other side. He always kept an eye on eternal glory. He mentions it so many times in his writings in the New Testament. And how he was always looking ahead and always looking to eternal glory with the very one who saved him. But yet he understood to be content as long as he was in this world that he was going to serve the one who saved him. But yet he struggled and is longing to be freed from this world and to be in the presence of Christ. My goodness, should we not all have that attitude? Should we all not long to serve Him as we live in this world, but yet long to be freed from this world and to be in the presence of the very One who saved us? Christ in His prayer to the Father 
I'm departing from the world. They're staying in this world, but I'm coming to you. You've given them your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. So that what? They will be united just as we are. Meaning what? So that they will be called home one day into what? Into the glories of heaven. So that they will come home to us just as I'm going home to you. Jesus knew this is why he said in was it John chapter fourteen verse uh, sixteen or something like that. John, Jesus said, I'm, "I'm I'm not leaving you comforter, comfortless. I'm going to send you another comforter, the promise of the Holy Spirit." He understood that that as Jesus physically leaves this world, if you will, you know they're going to be all all to pieces. He sends the Holy Spirit to them to comfort them as they as, as they live in this world that absolutely what hates them. Why does the world hate them? Why does the world hate you as a believer? Because what? Because you're not of this world. You don't live for this world. You, you cut against the grain of this world. If you long to serve Christ deeply, if you will, in, in, in your life as a believer... I can assure you of this. You will set off a reaction wherever you go. The world is not going to be happy with you. But yet as you serve Him, as you set off a reaction behind you as you serve Him, we keep in view what? The glory of going home someday into the presence of Christ. During my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that not one was lost except the one, what? Who was headed for destruction as the scriptures foretold the appointed one. Now I'm coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world. So that they would be filled with my joy. You see as long as there's nothing in this world. That's going to give you what? Joy. This world offers a sort of temporary happiness. But it's not spiritual joy. Nothing in this world is going to give you joy. I told them many things while I was with them in this world. So that they would be filled with my joy. It would be filled with my joy, the joy that I give, which is spiritual, which comes from the Father, from the Son, and to the believer. In this world, we don't have joy coming from it. We have anxiety. We have trouble sometimes, persecutions. In this world, those who live godly will suffer what? Persecution. What our longing should be as we live in this world for going home into the presence of Christ. But as we live in this world, as believers, as we serve Him, Christ, in His love for us, has filled us with what? With a joy. With a joy. He has filled us with a joy. Now I'm coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in the world. So that they would be filled with joy. There's two different reactions coming up here. In 13 and 14. I've given them your word. And the world hates them. You see? You see, you see where he's going with this? In this world. I will give them joy. They must stay in this world, in a world that hates them. Why? Because they do not belong to the world. They do not belong to this world. And if we jump back just really quick in your mind to Hebrews 13, 14, for this world is not our permanent home, for we are looking forward to a home yet to come. Why? Because this world, this world is not our home. 
We do not belong here. He's saying in verse 14 of John chapter 17. For we don't belong here. It always amazes me how believers try to make friends, if you will, with the things of the world or the way the world system is. It just makes no sense. Because if, if they understand Scripture correctly, there's nothing in the world that loves them. Everything of the world is against them. I've given them what? Your word. Filled them with joy. Given them your word. You're a privileged people. We're a privileged people. We get to come in here tonight on a Sunday night and we sit in the pews. We can freely come and go as we please. We've been given joy. We've been filled with the word. Countless scriptures before us if we want it. We're very privileged as servants of the Most High. And the greatest of all end for us is what? Is that we breathe our last breath and are immediately in the presence of the glorious one. The one who's offered this prayer up for his disciples so many years ago. He says, I've given them your word and the world hates them. The world hates them. That's how it is. There's a hatred of saints. There's a hatred of saints. But there's a promise of joy given to these saints. Not from the world, but a promise of joy that's given to the saints from Christ Himself. They do not belong to this world. Just as, I not, just as I do not belong to the world. Christ goes back to be with the Father. He goes back to be with the Father. He did His job. He did it perfectly. The ultimate sacrifice, the one-time sacrifice, once and for all sacrifice, He did the will of the Father perfectly. He did it. You pick that up down there in verse 4 of John chapter 17. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. What work? The redemption of mankind which brings glory to the Father. It's an amazing thing. And he says, now I leave this world and I go back to you, Father. I go to you. The interesting thing about that all is as He goes to the Father, so too do we. When we breathe our last breath, when our work is completed here on earth, no, we will never do it like Christ has done it by any means. But when our work is completed here on earth, when we can see and know that the time is drawing near that we'll be called home into the glorious presence of the very one who has saved us. We'll be called away, if you will. We will be called away from this world that hates us because we don't belong to the world that hates Christ because he doesn't belong to the world in John 17, verse 14. But the interesting thing, again, in verse 15 of John chapter 17, is this. He says, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe. To keep them safe. I'm not asking you to take them from the world, but to keep them safe. You see, Satan is still moving about like a roaring lion. 
seeking who he can devour, divide, and conquer, if you will. Jesus says, I'm not asking you to take them out of this world, but to keep them safe. To keep them safe from the evil one. As long as we're in this world, we serve the Lord God. We serve Him according to His will. We long to please Him. And sometimes we find ourselves in a struggle as Paul found himself in Philippians chapter 1 verse 20. For I fully expect and hope that I'll never be ashamed but that I'll continue to be bold for Christ as I've been in the past and I trust that my life will bring glory and honor to Christ whether I live or die. For me living means for Christ and dying is even better. But if I live I can do it more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. Remember this passage from this morning. I'm torn between these two desires. In other words, I'm left here. I'm left here in this world. The Spirit of the Lord God will keep me safe until the appointed time to, to call me home. But I long to go home now to be with Christ. Which would be far better for me. But for your sake, it is better that I continue to live. In verse 24 of Philippians chapter 1. You see, if you jump back to John chapter 17... I'm not asking you to take them out of this world, verse 15. Why? Because they, the Lord God was not done with them. So it was far better for them also to be left until He was done with them. It was far better, just as it was far better for, for Paul to be left, as he makes mention in verse 24, but for your sakes it is better that I continue to live. Something similar in John chapter 17, verse 15, I'm not asking you to take them out of this world, as he's speaking of his disciples, but to keep them safe from the evil one. Jesus is leaving, and it's far better for what? It's the will of the Father for the disciples to be left here, to continue on, to carry on the will of the Father until the appointed time for them to go home in glory. Same thing for you, same thing for me, as we serve the Lord Jesus Christ as we're left here. This is where we are to be until He what? Calls us home. Until He calls us home. And then when He calls us home, we go. But until then, until then, we serve Him. We serve Him. We seek to glorify Him. Yes, we long for the eternal home in the presence of the Son and the Father, and the Holy Spirit, all but one. We, we long for that. But while we are here, we continuously serve Him. The interesting thing is, as he's praying for his disciples, if you remember in our, pre in our study of this passage of Scripture probably a long time ago, the future believers was picked up verse 20 to 26 as he prayed for them, which would have referenced us. They do not belong to this world any more than I do, he says in verse 16 of John chapter 17. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. That should thrill you. Why? Because basically what he's saying is they are mine. I am in them. They belong to me. And when it's all over they will be with me eternally. So too for you, for me, we don't belong in this world anymore and Christ does or did. But we're here for our appointed time. And we serve Him. 
We serve Him for His glory and for His honor. And yet we long to be freed from this mess in which we live. Because remember, according to John chapter 15, verse 18 and 19, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. Christ is saying, listen, don't be shocked when the world hates you. Like I said before, it never amazes me that, the, that, that, that some, in, some, in the Christian, some in the Christian circles today get all shocked and, and, and get all bothered by that the world hates them. Why are you shocked by that? It should hate you. It should despise you. You should not fit tightly knit into the things of this world. If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first, John 15, 18. It hates you, why? Because you're of Christ. You're of the very one who saved you. You're not of the world. That's why believers have a longing, do they not? That's why believers have a Hebrews 13, 14 longing for this world is not our permanent home. That's why Peter was speaking to those in his letter as they were suffering much persecution. He's saying, listen, they're going to hate you. They're going to persecute you. You're going to suffer much loss. But understand, this is not your permanent home. Come to grips with the fact, Peter was saying, that yes, it will hate you. This world will hate you. But look forward to coming home, if you will, and to the glory of the very one who saved you. The world hates you. Remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belonged to it. There it is. There it is. Like I said before a few minutes ago, it, it, it's shocking to see how believers long to be accepted from a world that hates them. If you truly serve Christ, if you truly long to worship Christ, the world is going to despise you, hate you, want to get rid of you. And honestly, you should want to despise hate the world, and want to get rid of the world too. You should want to be free to them in longing for the glory of Christ. The world will love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you are no longer part of what? The world! Christ says you are no longer part of the world. Why? Why? Why are you no longer part of the world? Is it something that, that, that you just drummed up in yourself? That you just woke up one day and you said, You know what? I'm not really, I really don't want to be part of the world anymore. So I'm just going to take a different path. No. What does he continue to say in verse 19 about the difference between this world and your eternal home? You are no longer part of this world because I chose you to come out of what? The world. I chose you. Out of this world. Just as the Father chose each and every disciple and gave them to the Son, just as He chose each and every believer yesterday, today, and into the future. Just as He's done them, He's chose them, He's chose you out of the world. So now the world, what? If you live for Him, hate you. Hate you. They were okay with the Apostle Paul. They were okay with Saul, I should say world that mind Saul Saul was running around breathing frets killing Christians making widows making widowers killing everyone in his path that didn't agree with him 
won't care less. But the minute he was chosen out of the world, what happens in Saul's life? Outside of his name being changed, the world all of a sudden what? Hates him, longs to do away with him, and as he's serving Christ more and more, he sees his calling by Christ for the service here in this lost and dying world. And he matures on in his ministry for Christ. Years later down the road, he says, Oh, I long to be free from this body and to be in the presence of the very one who saved me. But it's, it's better for me just to be here right now to, to help you out, if you will. It's far better for you, for me, to be left here as he mentions in Philippians chapter chapter 1 and back to Hebrew or back to John chapter 17 verse 16 they do not belong to this world any more than I do make them holy by your truth teach them your word which is truth just as you sent me into the world I'm sending them into the world I'm sending them into the world I'm sending my disciples into the world to what? To do what I've called them to do. I gave myself as a holy sacrifice. That's Hebrews 9, 11 through 15, amongst other passages of Scripture, a holy sacrifice for them so, so they can be made holy by your truth. As they live in this sinful, wretched, depraved, world I'm sending them into what into this world and may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me the disciples are sent into the world they're sent into the world if you will sent into the land around them to proclaim Salvation is in Christ and Christ alone in this lost and dying world. And all along as they're doing that, as you see, as Peter was one of those men, they're encountered with having to encourage other believers that were suffering so much at the hands of the world, at the hands of the enemy, and encourage them and remind them that, listen, this is not your permanent home. look forward to a home that is yet to come. We must remind ourselves of that constantly. We must remind ourselves that this world is not our what? Permanent home. There's a passage in 1 John really quick in, in 1 John chapter, chapter 2 verse 15 speaking of the cravings of this world the cravings of this world that just fade away to learn to not love the things of this world but love what is coming to us long for what is coming to us do not love the things of this do not love the, this world nor the things that it offers you for when you love the world, you do not have to love the Father in you. For the world only craves after physical pleasures, a craving for everything we see. Pride, achievements, possessions. I'm just moving down through this pretty quickly. The world fades away along with everything the people crave. These are the things of the world. This is what the world craves. But you and I as believers, we live in this craving world but that craves earthly pleasures, craves temporary things. But we what? We crave, we look forward to a home yet to come. We look forward to the coming one. We look forward to the coming one. We look forward to Christ. We look forward to Him. We look forward to Him coming and, and taking, us, taking us home in His glory. That's what we look forward to. To being in His presence 
for His glory, for His honor, for it's all about Him. So as the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 13, as the writer of Hebrews goes down through these concluding words in his writings, as if whoever it was, it's as if he's encouraging the listener. He's encouraging the reader. This world is not your permanent home. And he does this after the great chapter chapter 11 where you see by faith so many went through so much pain and suffering we come we come across what we would call Hebrews chapter 13 and it's encouraging words this world is not our permanent home we are looking forward to a home yet to come and then he says in verse 15 as we get it from the translators. Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance, our allegiance to His name. The writer of Hebrews now says, listen, therefore, after we've heard so much of what Christ has done from Hebrews 1 to Hebrews 13... We see that this is not our permanent home. We look forward to a, 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 an eternal home with Christ. Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to Him. So the writer of Hebrews is saying, listen, as, he, as he's getting ready to, to wrap up this, this letter, if you will, in Hebrews, he says, let us offer a praise to the very one who saved us. Let us proclaim our allegiance to him. Let us give our allegiance to him, to the very one who saved us. Let us praise him. For he is the one who has transformed us. And if you jump down to verse 20 and 21, tying it in, he says, Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him, all glory to him forever and ever. Amen. It ties so well with verse 15. Your ability to proclaim, your ability to proclaim allegiance, your ability to give praise, your ability to shout joy to the Most High doesn't come from you personally. It's produced in you through the power of the very one who has saved you. That's the only way you can please Him. That's the only way I can please Him. That's the only way you can please Him. Every good thing we do comes from Him. It's pleasing to Him. And the author of Hebrews at the end of verse 21, for all glory to Him forever and ever. Amen. He says, listen. Look forward to the eternal home of the very one who has saved you. Rest in that. Rest in Him. Be watchful for, for others. Care for others. As He's closing out this, this, this book, this letter of Hebrews, and as He makes mention a few times of spiritual leaders, and it's a different subject, a different day. But as we close... May we take rest in knowing out of John chapter 17 as we live in this fallen world and we long to be in the presence of Christ that the very one who saved us has petitioned for us to the Father. There's nothing in us. It's all of Him. 
And as he cared for his disciples a few thousand years ago, so too he cares for you today. As he cared for the Old Testament saints longer than that ago, so too he cares for us today. As they look forward to the coming one, may we look forward to the coming one for his glory, for his honor, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Well, Father, Lord, we love you and we, we thank, you for, thank you for your word this evening, Lord God, as we looked into the pages of Scripture. Thank you for its truth and may we, Lord God, just continue to love you, to serve you, to praise you, to long for that eternal home, to be free from this body this decaying body, and to be in your presence. Well, we don't know how long we're left here, but while we are here, may we serve you well. May this church serve you well. May it be all for your glory, and may we be reminded that all the praises we do offer up, all the service we do offer up, we offer up not in our own power and strength, but in the power and strength that comes from you. Bring us back here this Wednesday night at 6 o'clock to once again look upon your truth. Lord, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.